Sure. Yeah, let's get started. Uh, so here's the call to order. We are now officially started uh, for the Research Data and Innovation Subcommittee, the quarterly meeting that we have going on. Uh, so thanks for everyone being able to attend. Uh, it's really, really good to see you uh, and being able to do a virtual meeting too. Uh, so we'll kick off with uh, a roll call. Um, so when I you know, announce your name, please come on and and uh, let me know you're here. So I'm here, Dave Davis. Yes, sir, I'm here. All right, Whitney Katzmark. Dan McFarlane. Uh, Norm Rowan, I think I said that right. I'm here as the alternate. This is Rebecca Murphy. All right, Rebecca, we're doing so I'm here. I'm Jessica Whitehead. Carol. Uh, Karen. Yes, I'm here. Awesome. Good to have you, Karen. Mark. Mark Molly. Here from them is Troy. Yes, good morning. I'm here. Uh, good morning, Wendy. Over on. Good morning. I'm Wendy's here. Hi, Wendy. And then Michael. Good morning. This is Mike. All right, Mike. And Mary Jason. Uh, Ian Blair as alternative. For Mary All right. All right, yeah. All right, thanks. Um, Matt, I think we want to introduce uh, Stan Tech and Launch. Is that yes. what we want to do in the next one, Yeah. Uh, great. So, uh, Linda, if you don't mind coming on and introducing your team. Sure, thank you. So, I'm Linda Warren from Launch Consulting. I am a water resource engineer and I'm also a professional facilitator. And with us here, we've got three additional facilitators because we're going to be doing some breakout rooms later. So you will meet Rebecca and Cece and Morgan in a little bit. Thanks for having us. Awesome. All right, over to uh, well, actually adoption of the uh, agenda. Um, so uh, here's the meeting agenda. Um, do I have a motion to uh, adopt this agenda? So moved. A second. I second. All right. So I have a motion to adopt and second the meeting agenda. Uh, approved. All right. Now moving on to the uh, quarterly meeting minutes um, from uh, previous uh, meeting. Is there any discussion on the on the meeting minutes of anyone else? All right, not hearing any. So uh, do I have a motion to adopt the meeting minutes? Motion to adopt. Awesome. Thank you, Ian. Second. Second. Okay. Thanks, Troy. All right. So I have a motion to adopt the meeting minutes, and we have now adopted them. So, awesome. All right. Matt, over you for a subcommittee. Great. Thank you, Alex. Um, hello, everyone. Uh, just real quickly, these are the objectives for the subcommittee. And I'd like to thank you all for your input that you provided today, especially on the development of our flood hazard exposure models and inputs on to uh, how we're doing our flood hazard risk assessment. I'll have a little bit of an update of where we stand with both of those. Uh, but then the other key objective is developing recommendations for future planning, which is a really a key component of today's meetings and the next two meetings that we will have as a subcommittee. Um, these recommendations uh, are not limited to kind of how the research and data products, what do we need to help meet the state's needs and uh, our stakeholders across the coastal region, uh, and then also to advise on innovations to help uh, address some of the gaps and risks that we have to to accomplishing our objectives and and building overall flood resilience uh, in our region. Uh, 
This can include some different research and development, partnerships, collaborative research, uh, but these innovations and uh, research isn't limited to just the data itself that can be uh, applied to the process, can be applied to the products um, that we're using, either financial tools or actual physical uh, construction means and methods. So uh, really looking forward to, to talking about uh, some of these potential recommendations later on uh, in the meeting. Quick overview of where we stand. Um, we are closing in on the end of the year, about six months left until we need to deliver phase two of the plan. Uh, we are progressing along uh, with multiple contractors. Now uh, we've had Dewberry uh, under contract helping us with the flood hazard data development and updating the impact assessment. Uh, we have the Stantec and Launch team helping us out with reviewing our plan resilience actions, uh, what's in our, our database, uh, and using that along with the impact assessment to really tell the story in the phase two plan uh, and get that published uh, by the end of the, this calendar year. And then another key component is, again, these subcommittee recommendations. Uh, and then we're working with uh, Stantec and Launch on our outreach and engagement. Uh, but we also have AECOM on board, who's helping out with our public outreach. Um, so you'll start to see more from them uh, shortly uh, as they help us with our public facing uh, materials and building awareness for the different activities that are going on. So moving along, but it is a tight schedule to get it all done by the end of the year. Um, here is our subcommittee schedule. We are in our Q2 meeting. After this meeting, we will have two more uh, meetings left of the subcommittee. Uh, we will discuss, uh, I guess, an overview of the, the high-level agenda provide some updates on where we're at with the phase two plan, but really the focus of the remainder of these meetings will be on uh, getting our recommendations finalized. Uh, and this is a similar uh, setup across the other three subcommittees to the TAC. Any questions on where we're at or, and what we're doing uh, before I move into some of the old business items? All right, uh, so an old business, uh, there's two items I wanted to cover. One is the integrated flood hazard scenarios for planning, uh, which are slightly different than what we did with phase one and just wanted to put out the kind of the final look at how we're doing these uh, scenarios. Then give you an update on where we stand with the, the flood hazard data that we're gonna be using uh, to capture all major sources of flooding, which feed into those scenarios. Uh, and then really get into the, the subcommittee recommendations. So first up is our planning scenarios and the data that helps support those scenarios. Um, so this is based on prior discussions of this subcommittee and the TAC at large on uh, how are we organizing our information and presenting that uh, and considering it as we kind of try to plan and have data for the future. Um, so we have our reference scenario, kind of our baseline of where we're at today or a little beyond looking backwards on what we have. Uh, so in the coastal, we're using the 2020 CRMP data, which is really tidal adjusted um, coastal flooding from the tidal flooding and storm surge. Using Atlas 14, uh, uh, values for the pluvial flooding and then using the FEMA data for the fluvial. As we plan for the future, uh, we've broken out two planning horizons in near future, the next uh, 25, 30 years here with uh, 2020, 2060 approximate time frame, uh, and then a far future planning horizon, more long, long term out 2060 out to 2100. Within each planning horizon, we have two uh, different risk tolerances, a moderate risk tolerance, which is kind of the baseline that we all should be using. And then there's a low risk tolerance, more uh, suitable uh, for critical infrastructure or other types of uh, situations, environment where you don't have a lot of adaptive capacity or there is a lot of risk should this exposure and impact uh, really could expand and impact a lot of people. So higher water levels, more rain, 
uh, that we're using. You'll see that our fluvial data is limited to the FEMA data because that is what we have. Um, but on the fluvial side, we're using the RCP 4.5 median values that work with the MRSA projections, uh, and then the 90th percentile uh, values on the low risk tolerance. Uh, so this is kind of where we landed and we are organizing the data to fit these planning horizons and risk tolerances um, in the plan. Any questions here? All right, next up is a pluvial flood hazard data update. On the figure on the right is uh, shows all of the model boundaries. So these are the sub HUC 12 basins that have all been individually modeled with a 2D HECRAS uh, model. There are 1,830 of them. So we have a lot of data and information um, based on input from you all. Uh, We've run this on kind of a regular interval for three different durations, uh, two hour, six hour, and 24 hour. Um, and so we have those, all of those models are done. The models are available for download on AWS. Um, and then we also have the depth grids for all of those models and model runs. Um, where we have a tidal boundary uh, for these models, uh, those had to be run multiple times to account for the different um, sea level rise projections over time that we're working with. So there's a lot more in the tidal uh, area than where we have non-tidal. Um, and then we've also been working on and have completed uh, the planning scenario reference table. So how do we get from our kind of equal interval pluvial models to our planning scenarios and different recurrence intervals. Um, how do we match the, the 5, 10, 25, 50, 100, and 500 year return interval to those um, defined model runs at one, two, three, four, five inches? So that work has been done. Um, and now what we're working on right now with Dewberry is taking that, those reference tables and building out the planning scenario depth grids, which will then be used for the impact analysis. Um, we are also working on uh, a user's guide for these models. And the user's guide isn't meant to tell people um, how to run HECRAS. There's lots of other uh, guidance and training available for that, but really trying to show how these models can be applied um, in different uh, use cases uh, whether if people want to run some compound flooding, uh, that that's a possibility. They can adjust tailwater elevations uh, that are higher than mean high water. If they want to adjust some of the topo, they could do that and run some different scenarios to evaluate projects. So we're trying to kind of put together a list of uh, different use cases and how how this data can help serve people and, and help them do their jobs uh, and make that data available. So that is something we're working on and are uh, meeting with different stakeholders to get some input on what should go in this user's guide. Uh, so if any of you all are interested in providing some input and reviewing that initial outline, uh, please let us know, send us an email, and uh, we can include you in the, uh, the distribution list. We plan on working with Dewberry to host a couple webinars to present this and solicit uh, feedback. From, from different stakeholder groups. Any questions on the pluvial flood hazard? All right, uh, beyond that is taking pluvial coastal and fluvial, how do we combine it both visually to show the combined flood hazard um, and also how do we start combining that data, the impact data, um, especially with fluvial being a little bit more challenging because we have the one return period where we have multiple return periods with pluvial and coastal. So this is a work in progress. Uh, Dewberry's doing a lot of the, the calculations and then we're gonna be working with the Stantec and launch team on uh, reviewing the data and understanding what's the data telling us to try to put forward kind of compelling stories in the plan uh, for the different regions and types of assets. Uh, so that's kind of a work in progress right now. 
Any other comments or questions before we move into recommendations? All right, uh, so I'll give you all an overview of kind of the recommendation process uh, and how it's gonna work over the next uh, meetings and what we're trying to achieve with these recommendations. Have a quick summary of some of the, the work that we've discussed to date. Uh, then I'll hand it over to Linda uh, to engage in the facilitated discussion for the recommendations. So first up, what are we trying to do with these recommendations? Um, really trying to figure out ways to either improve this planning process that we're going through with the Coastal Resilience Master Plan. We know we need to do it again in five years. So what can DCR or others do to help make this planning process better and, and come out with better um, outcomes. Um, but then also what actions need or should be taken in the next one to four years between these planning periods? Uh, what else can be done to help support uh, building resilience across the coastal region and moving us forward? Uh, the recommendations can be geared towards a variety of audiences. Um, so it's not just what DCR can do, but it could be what uh, the government can do, the legislature, PDCs, local governments, um, we're all kind of involved here. Uh, and so we want to try to figure out um, uh, who, what level of actor is needed to move some of these things forward. Um, we're trying to use general terms. Um, and so not to call out an individual agency, uh, especially if we don't work in that agency. So we wouldn't be calling out VDOT needs to do this. VDEM should be doing that, or this specific PDC needs to do this. Um, we're just trying to uh, figure out what, what some of the next steps are and then can work towards identifying who's the right person or agency or group uh, to do that. Overall, we're aiming for three to five recommendations per subcommittee, which would give us 12 to 20 uh, recommendations total that'll go in front of the, the full tech. Uh, these recommendations then would be presented in a section of the plan document itself and then be presented as recommendations coming from the TAC and the subcommittees, and these are not DCR recommendations. Um, so to that end, uh, DCR really isn't uh, participating in these discussions that we have for recommendations. These are your all's uh, recommendations on what you think uh, can and should happen uh, again in the next couple of years as well as in the next uh, planning cycle. This is a very much collaborative process. So we're hoping to give each and every one of you uh, a voice and, and launch is helping to facilitate that discussion. So please uh, be prepared to engage today. Um, we are not starting from scratch uh, because we've been talking about this uh, and some of the things we could be doing in some of our prior meetings. The phase one plan highlighted some uh, technical improvements that could be done. We've heard from other stakeholders as well and have done some uh, surveys for the TAC membership. Uh, so again, not starting from scratch, but want to build off of those and try to highlight the most kind of critical and important uh, recommendations that you all see coming out of uh, uh, this group within the realm of research, data, and innovation. Um, you, these recommendations that come out of the subcommittee are going to be presented to the full TAC in the Q4 meeting for uh, a vote of the full TAC. Um, so we need to try to get out, we need to get out of our Q4 meeting with finalized uh uh, recommendations that are coming out of this subcommittee that the subcommittee has voted on. Um, after each subcommittee meeting, we have a full TAC meeting. The next one uh, is June 18th. At those TAC meetings, each subcommittee will report out and give an update of where they stand uh, with recommendations and what are the themes or topics and some examples of the recommendations that they're working on. This will help uh, either identify where there's overlap in, in recommendations coming from different subcommittees or where there's a gap and that there might be something that one subcommittee figured another was doing, but they aren't doing it. So it's an opportunity to try to identify uh, 
uh, some recommendations that might be missing. So that'll be critical at this June meeting um, to listen and hear what others are doing to either say, we're working on that too, and we can figure out who should maybe take the lead on that, or maybe some nobody's discussing an item and try to figure out all right, what subcommittee uh, could work on that. Um, again, we aren't starting from scratch. Uh, these are some of the kind of working in this research data and innovation theme, uh, some of the items that we've talked about before um, in this uh, group, um, kind of natural nature-based functionality, understanding um, how effective some of these different uh, features are at reducing flood potential. Um, we've talked about uh, data, right? We're expanding the land cover data this year from the Chesapeake Bay statewide, but nobody really owns that um, and has that programmed into uh, kind of an agency responsibility. Uh, similarly with LIDAR, kind of understanding where we need that, who, who should own and manage that process. Um, and then on some of the innovation, kind of the needs to discuss some of the different products and materials that are available that can help us build resilience um, and kind of linking that also to some of the regulatory uh, processes that occur and making sure that these innovative products are also uh, in line or linked into the regulatory process so that they can actually be um, installed and implemented. Um, we've heard from our phase one, there's additional uh, needs that were identified on the research, right? Expanding our tribal engagement and trying to understand that better. Again, that's not really related to hard data, but that's still within the realm of this subcommittee. Um, how do we have a better way of identifying and develop uh, projects where there's hot spots of flood hazard impacts? Um, standardizing the data uh, was a big uh, technical improvement uh, that was called out for uh, in, in phase one. Um, we started to address some of the flood hazards, especially with uh, the rainfall driven flooding and are working uh, to meet that need in phase two. Um, and then an in innovation in phase one called out for additional financial tools and processes. This is one where there could be overlap with the funding subcommittee. Um, so again, if we do kind of go into that uh, realm of financial tools, again, uh, doesn't mean we can't if we need innovation uh, but once we kind of see where we land with that recommendation, the full TAC meeting will be a good way to identify where we're at with that and whether that would stay with this group or if it needs to go to the funding subcommittee. So any questions on the overall kind of process and thoughts for recommendations before I hand it over to Linda? All right, Linda, it's all yours. Thanks, Matt. So welcome to Friday morning before Memorial Day. And what we're going to do in the next about hour and 15 minutes, actually, is have a really good involved discussion around what these recommendations could be. And so go ahead to the next slide. I'll give you a, an agenda for that next hour and 15 minutes. So the first thing we'll do, we're going to look at these draft themes that Matt has started in on introducing. And those themes, they're just categories to help you think. So recommendations, any type that you would like, they might fit in those categories. If they're outside, that's okay. We're just trying to give you some um, thinking points, some platforms on which to jump from for thinking. And then we're going to individually brainstorm recommendations when we first get into those breakout rooms. And in doing that, we wanna make sure that your cameras are on in the breakout rooms, if at all possible. And we wanna make sure we can hear you as well as we wanna make sure you can use the chat function. So right now, if you can, go ahead and enter anything you want to into that chat function. You can say hello, you can say a thought. Um, you might say, maybe something that is most important to you involving flooding recommendations, anything at all. And we'll just make sure one of our facilitators will double check here and make sure that everybody is able to use the chat function. And that's for the members. So if you're a member of the subcommittee, 
that's who we want to hear from in the chat. If you're a member of the public, we're really glad you're here. And we're going to be talking with you if you'd like to give comment at 1140 after we have the member discussions. So if you're a member of the public, when we do go into breakout rooms, you'll be in a breakout room too. But just take notes on things you'd like to say and then bring them up towards that last 20 minutes of our time together today. So it's great. Thanks for entering into the chat there. And then we're also, I'm going to call on you just a little bit to make sure your microphones are working over the next 10 minutes or so. Um, so if for any reason your mic is not working, go ahead and put something into chat when we're trying to talk with you and we'll solve it. So after we do breakout room discussions, that'll happen for about half an hour. And there'll be three different breakout rooms, everyone talking about the same types of subjects, but really having a small group discussion to help get you thinking. We'll come back together for about 15 minutes and we'll do a report out from the breakout rooms and also just a general discussion. And you'll be amazed at how many recommendations you'll come up with in just a little bit more than an hour. And after this meeting, before Q3's meeting, we're going to be sending you a survey or questionnaire, if you will. And it will be a very quick and easy thing to answer. It's going to be a list of the recommendations that you came up with. And it's just going to ask you your preferences on priority of those recommendations. You'll also be able to add any in at that point. And then when we get together in Q3, we'll be talking about all those recommendations and taking them a little bit further towards decisions. Okay, next slide. <clears throat> so with the recommendation topics for this committee, this subcommittee here, the main focus for you is on data development plan to fill the gaps in advance of future planning processes and also on innovations. So it's a great time to be creative on a Friday. So any innovations that might be suited to address flood risks, fill gaps in any resilience actions you can think of for future planning efforts, consider research and development, public-private partnerships, collaborative research, anything you can think of that might be of, of help. Next slide. So really some basic themes that match the name of your subcommittee to help give categories to these different recommendations. So research, data, innovation. And if there's some other themes or categories for recommendations, let's talk about them right now. So we're gonna go through, there's a slide for each of these three and then a chance to say if there's a fourth one. So let's go to the next slide on research. Just to give you a little background, and then I'll, I'll start to kind of ask each of you questions to check your mic. So for research, this theme, basic description of it would be applying research to the Coastal Resilience Master Plan, flood resilience planning and processes. So anything about research that applies here. Questions that you might consider when you're coming up with recommendations. And these are not the only questions, you can have others. These are just some example ones, but Maybe what new flood resilience research has been published that can be applied in future coastal resilience master plan phases? How can research be applied to project scale metrics and monitoring techniques? And then, because this is the most important piece for you today, the recommendations themselves. So if we were all in a big room together, I would hand you sticky notes and on each sticky note, you'd put a recommendation. So in this case, you're going to be typing those recommendations into chat once we get into the breakout rooms. So when you do it, an example recommendation here would be support research to evaluate flood reduction metrics of natural and nature-based solutions to support future prioritization efforts. So see how it's, it's a little bit general, but it starts with an action verb. And that's going to be your key. All of these recommendations, they shouldn't be just an, a noun. Like you wouldn't just say, database. You would say, utilize this database too. So you're making them very active. We want these recommendations to take off and, and have some great meaning. So that's the kind of general setup on the research theme. Let me just ask, I'll ask Alex. Alex, 
does this make sense to you? Is there anything that you would add around this? Basic research, anything you want people to be aware of? Just testing your mic. Um, no, uh, I think I think it makes sense to me. Um, I do like to just highlight the action portion of it. You know, the more the more actionable items is always better, I think, is you know, give something for us to, to shoot for um, versus um, data. What better data? All right. I, I, I like the actionable and specific mix of it. That's great. So we're going to, we'll get to action. Thank you. And I'll call on, how about Ian? And Ian, you've been part of this process for a few of the subcommittees. So how is this research as a theme? Any thoughts from you? Okay. is better, supportive. Awesome. Glad and glad we could hear you. Go ahead to the next slide. Theme of data. So the basic description, your sourcing, utilizing, and programmatic management of high quality data to improve models, risk assessment, and planning approaches. So that gives you your theme. I imagine that's been a lot of discussion in past meetings too. And questions to consider, where does the Coastal Resilience Master Plan require more comprehensive and or updated data? And an example recommendation, starting with a verb, develop a data development plan with assigned data owners to obtain and manage data in advance of future planning and support informed planning decisions. So I wanna point out something. These example recommendations, just like any recommendations from the past, if you want to keep them and you want them to move forward, you must put them back on the table here today. So if, for example, you love these, put them into chat. They won't become real recommendations until you as subcommittee members bring them forward. So that's an important point. Troy, can we test your mic? Any thoughts about data? Um, yeah. No, I, I think it looks fine. Um, I suspect this will probably be maybe one of the lighter themes because the research ideas and innovation ideas really will become about generating data. So it becomes a kind of how do we going to use it? How are we going to hold, share it broadly? How's it going to get into the process? So I'm not sure of what I would see beyond that in this category. Great point. And to that point, you might find that your recommendations cross all categories or different categories. And that's fine because the categories themselves they're just to help generate ideas. It's the recommendations that you're trying to get to. So thank you for that. How about Mark? Any thoughts about data or this theme of data? Let's see if Mark can unmute. And so Mark, we're going to, and sometimes people step away, that's not a problem. But if you can't unmute, um, please put something into chat and we'll be able to see what's going on with that. But I'll skip Mark for a second and go to Wendy. Are you able to unmute Wendy? Is Wendy still here? Actually, what Wendy might have, Wendy has fallen off, I think. How about Mike? Good morning. Um, yeah, you actually answered the, the one question I had. I was wondering how firm those boundaries would be between research data and innovation. But I, I think your, your statement that ultimately we're just trying to get to the recommendations and those those uh, those boxes, if you will, don't really matter. That that gives me a level of comfort. So I appreciate that. Okay, great. Thanks. So let's go to the third theme. Innovation. So for innovation, basic theme description, advise on innovation suitable to address flood risks and fill gaps in resilience action. Different questions that might be considered. How can the Coastal Resilience Master Plan integrate research and development, public-private partnerships, and or collaborative research? 
where do flood resilience gaps exist that provide an opportunity for innovative solutions? And as an example, integrate innovative resilience products and solutions from planning into regulatory programs to facilitate implementation, bringing things to life. So on innovation, we have a few more mic checks. Karen, are you able to unmute? Yes, I'm here. Um, I don't have anything specific to add to this. This looks appropriate. Great, thank you. How about Jessica? Yeah, <clears throat> I think something that I would like to see us consider in this category is what is the best way to create space in the recommendations for innovations that by definition, because their innovations don't exist yet. Mm -hmm. So the landscape in this space three to five years from now may be very, very different than it is today, but we need to make sure that the recommendations that we craft are creating space for those that we may not know yet. And that's a little bit challenging in wording. Excellent, that's wonderful. So we'll bring that up again in the breakout rooms and get some wording on that. That will be really helpful. All the forward thinking, it's terrific in this group. So let's do another mic check. How about you, Norm? Is Norm able to unmute? Let's see if Norm is still here. Okay. Hmm, looks like not. Um, Rebecca, again? Uh, yep, I'm here. I don't have anything else to add. This looks good. Great, thanks. Dave. Hi there. No, I don't have anything else to add. All right, and Ben? Good morning, I don't have anything to add this time. Thanks. Um, so, let's see, Mark? Mark is uh, having trouble with unmuting. We'll send out the call-in number in case that's helpful for anyone that is still struggling to unmute. Great. Did I miss any subcommittee members who haven't said hello yet? Okay, let's go to the last slide. So if there are other themes besides those three, bring them forth right now. Is there anything that you can think of, anyone from the subcommittee, that might be another theme to consider? Okay. <clears throat> I've, I've got something that's not necessarily another theme, but I think something overarching to add to all of these. We have a tendency because of the funding mechanism and the, the way that this the, the CRMP has really been approached as a you know, data-driven you know, hazardous response approach to resilience planning to tend to think of projects and infrastructure projects. But we also want to acknowledge across all of the themes that not every resilience action is a infrastructure project. Um, and how do we make sure that our concepts include in not just the risk reduction quantification, but people and the decisions that they are making and are able to make is also something that we surface. Um, so a good example of this would be, you know, a locality that's doing home elevations is going to need to make sure that they have a really good emergency management evacuation strategy communications so that people whose homes have been elevated know when to move their cars. Wonderful. So that's, that's also a resilience action. And we also want to make sure that our recommendations are capturing those kinds of actions too. Fantastic. Thank you for bringing that forth right now in the whole group. Very important. Thinking outside of the box that sometimes people will go to, especially if we're in the engineering world, going to those physical improvements, it's not all about that. Thank you. Okay. 
So I think these will be our themes. You'll see these, every breakout room will be having the same topics for discussion. We're not, you know, once you go in a breakout room, you can talk about recommendations on any theme whatsoever. So I'll explain how the breakout rooms work. Next slide. When you're doing recommendations in those breakout rooms, make sure they start with a verb. And we ask that you also type them into chat. So we want the wonderful discussion going on. Your facilitators will also be capturing everything. But if you can verbalize it the way that you would like to, and if you have trouble verbalizing it, ask the group, work it out together, but go ahead and enter those into chat that will be important, starting with an action verb. Those recommendations apply to basically the next four years prior to the next planning phase. They will apply also to the planning process improvements. And as Matt said, we're trying to go a little bit more general and not point to exact agencies. So use something like state agencies versus VDIM. And then we'll be writing the theme number because it's one, two, and three for those themes that corresponds to your recommendation. So if you're telling a recommendation, you can tell your facilitator where to put it on the, they've got a PowerPoint slide they'll be putting them on so you can see them. You can tell your facilitator which category you'd suggest to put it under. And I think for recommendation tips, that's it. So for the breakout room discussions, in just a moment, we have you each in a separate breakout room. So you'll either be with our facilitators, Cece or Rebecca or Morgan. When you get to the breakout room, we ask that you start typing your recommendations into the chat and just make sure each recommendation, you hit enter right after. So each one's separate in the chat. We also are gonna ask that in the beginning, you choose a sp spokesperson to kind of summarize when we get back as a full group, just to speak out about kind of the highlights that you were discussing. And then your facilitator will help you keep things going and organize those recommendations. And you will also have someone in your room from DCR listening to that discussion. If you have questions for them, you can ask. And then about 11.25 or so, I'll check on your groups before then, but about 11.25, we're going to come back to that main room for a full group discussion. So if you've never been in a breakout room before, it's a little bit like going into hyperspace and then all of a sudden you appear into your breakout room. So when I hit the button to open them, you'll have to hit accept. There's a little button that you'll push to be at a pop on your screen. And then after a couple seconds, there you'll be in this breakout room. Everything should work as normal, your chat, as well as your mic, everything is being recorded. And then when the rooms are done, you might see me about five minutes till put out a broadcast message that you'll see breakout rooms will close in five minutes. When your facilitator asks you to come back to the main room, the bottom corner, just like if you were going to leave the meeting, you'll see a little leave button. What you wanna do is press that leave button, but don't leave the whole meeting, just go back to the main room. If for some reason you fell off of Zoom, come right back on, you can just log back in again. But just pick that button to come back to the main room because we definitely want your discussion. Does anybody have questions about anything at all before we do the breakout rooms? Okay. And we do ask again, try as best as you can to turn your camera on while you're in the breakouts because it'll feel more like you're in person. Okay. Um, one more thing to say, if for any reason you're having trouble, you can always come back to the main room because Wheeler will be in the main room. I'll be there, or I'll be popping it around to make sure things are going well and we can help fix anything that's going on. If you don't like your group, you can always come back and ask to go in a different one, <laughs> but we'll be able to have it so that we're kind of evenly divided up. Okay, I'm gonna open these rooms and I'll see you in a few.
kind of questions that we think are still out there. Um, we know that we're not the only state working on this challenge. And so getting a sense of what others are doing, um, trying to avoid recreating the wheel, um, see what others are doing well, what we're, what we might be doing well, but just to kind of get a sense of how we compare and how we could maybe take lessons learned from other states and apply that to what we're doing here in Virginia. Um, some specific things we identified looking at um, how well natural and nature-based solutions actually, actually address flood reduction or looking at the needs for Virginia to develop our own social vulnerability index. Um, we don't, we're using a lot of there are a lot of different products out there. It's unclear whether any of them are actually really good for what we're trying to do here. So looking into that, um, kind of at a more uh, data level, looking at kind of just how do we, what kind of data do we really need? And then how do we make sure that we get that data, right? We have uh, noticed in, in Virginia uh, that oftentimes we don't really seem to have a long-term plan for ongoing acquisition and funding for, for data acquisition and collection. So having that covered as part of the plan um, and then looking at some specific data collection needs for um, ag for using drones to collect data either that's kind of hard to get with our typical models we talked about bridge decks for one example but also things like shoreline change um, and then uh, on the innovation side looking at where we know that there are some regulatory barriers to testing out different practices so whether those are state regulatory barriers or federal ones, but being able to kind of work with the different regulatory agencies to, to allow us the flexibility to, to work with, with public researchers, but also with private parties to kind of test out these practices that might be worth um, exploring for uh, scaling up later on. So that's, that's kind of where we were at in our group. Thank you. You're on mute, Linda. <laughs> Thank you. Anyone have comments or thoughts based on what Ben was reporting out? Do you see some similarities? I have a question about the this is Karen McGlathery. Um, I'm using the drone. Are there other states that are using drone data to assess risk and flooding? Ben or anybody else? Anyone know about the drones in the other states? I don't know yeah. about states that are necessarily doing it, but there was an interesting case. I want to say it was in North Carolina. Um, and Karen, I can find it for you and send it to you, but it raised some alarm bells for me where um, a private company was attempting to add drone surveying on property, not necessarily for flood, but overall uh, to their product list that they were providing for customers. And the uh, courts decided that that business owner was not allowed to do it without a professional surveying license. Interesting. Thanks. Well, let's go to breakout room two and screen share. So Rebecca will yes. share. Her slide. Yes, Who's and then we have uh, Karen and um, Troy, who are going to um, kind of tackle that together discussion. So um, Karen or Troy, if you wanted to start us off. Sure, so um, I'll start off with the research. Uh, so we talked about the need to um, support research on monitor monitoring and modeling of groundwater. Um, both the salt, uh, groundwater levels and saltwater intrusion, um, and also develop measures for and methods to better um, monitor performance of resilience projects uh, across multiple ecosystem services, um, including economic valuation. And uh, Troy, do you want to mention in terms of the research we were talking about in terms of human adaptation behavior? Yeah, this was a kind of a category of human dimensions in general. Um, and some elements of this get picked up in the innovation theme too. Um, but gaining a better appreciation for what humans are gonna do to adapt uh, in, in incremental ways. Um, and, and that also can be asked at an organizational and communication, uh, community scales as well. 
And so for the data, we were thinking a lot about how the data was being were being visual uh, disseminated and visualized to different stakeholder groups. And so one of the things we thought about was the need to to um, aggregate the data in such a way that it prefer, preserves individual privacy. Uh, and so that's a data ethics issue. Um, we also I, talked about how do you keep this from becoming static? How do you keep it updated? Uh, and then the third thing we talked about was, again, sort of this is like the research aspirational, but once we are able to get data on groundwater um, with existing flood and infrastructure risk data sets, how do we disseminate those? And we talked about data visualization platforms that had different layers for these different uh, data sources that you could combine in order to look at your look at multiple risks in a single platform. Um, for innovation, um, do you want to take this, Troy? Sure, but I also wanted to make a quick point and underscore the privacy issue is if, if we get to expand the social science um, databases here, I'm appreciating that there are um, the most vulnerable communities are the ones that are, are going to continue to be even more vulnerable as a result of, of climate change impacts so, and resilience issues. So the privacy issues become even more important or even continue to be important. Uh, on the innovation side, I think we, in, in many ways, these are building a lot off of what Ben presented too um, and thinking through what do we need in the innovation domain to be able to um, uh, experiment a little bit more. And so one, it was about promoting the, you know, conducting use inspired R&D on adaptation solutions that enhance resilience. And there's just a few examples there. There's, there's a long list that could be generated. Much of this could be done in public private partnerships and in collaborative research, um, but, but focusing on some, some solutions. And 3B sort of recognizes that, um, Innovation is needed in, in so many domains. Uh, we came into this talking about finance, needing innovation in finance. We need innovation in infrastructure. We're thinking about new nature-based solutions. Well, it, there's an element of innovation in the policy domain too, and in regulatory um, regimes to um, to be more adaptive. And, and, and there are ways to experiment with that. So we thought about developing um, policy innovation tools that allow you to, to experiment. And we have examples. Um, we, that have come up in other areas that are um, kind of creating zones where you can do some experimentation, including um, testing out new tax in incentives, regulatory discretions, uh, discretionary authorities, ability to let permitting um, folks coordinate a lot and integrate. Um, and so that was that was sort of one of the domains or uh, suggestions of innovation. And then 3C, I'll, I'll hand back to you, Karen, because it really did build off of our visualization um, conversation too and, and, and engagement. Right, and so this idea was um, develop explicit ways to engage with and incorporate community and stakeholder input into the research priorities, the data visualization, and also the project implementation as we've written here in the bullet. But the point is simply to not talk at, but talk with. And so figuring out ways to do this effectively across the board. So it sort of goes back to the data needs and the research needs and how we're disseminating the data. So it's sort of wrapping it up in, we're not necessarily doing this particularly well in different communities. So how do we do it so that the the, the master plan product is as effective as it can be in, in terms of implementation by community members across the state. So that's, that's it for us. Fabulous discussion. So anyone have thoughts about anything that they just talked about? What does it bring up for you? Is anyone familiar with other states, what they're doing? Yeah, I I just want to add in there that there are, you know, a lot of entities, you know, Environmental Defense Fund, Pew. Um, who are supporting this state level discussion. And we probably don't necessarily need to reinvent the wheel there. Um, probably just need to check in with whatever the latest 2024 state of the state kind of uh, products are that are out there. Georgetown Climate Center is another one that does a lot in this space. Great, thanks. Well, let's go on and look at uh, breakout room three.
All right. Jess and Rebecca, if you want to take it away. Yeah. I I can I can go with that one. Um we at, at the same time of uh, recognizing that we only get three to five of these total for everyone, tried to be pretty broad in our wording um, at the same and create those those bigger buckets. So I think a lot of these, as I've heard the uh, breakout group reports, um, could fit as, as sub bullets in here. Um, but we talked about uh, making sure a lot of these are really structural and trying to recognize that um, we need to support structures that are going to help Virginia continue to make progress over the next four years up until you know the, the full flood resilience plan and phase three. Um, so a working group that will research progress on compound modeling and be able to secure additional funding so that we can advance that type of modeling in Virginia. Um, additional research on barriers and obstacles at the local scale for implementing resilience, uh, and what innovations are needed, and another one on benefits and costs of action and failing to take action is really important. Uh, for data, we talked about um, having something that supports these multi-institutional efforts on both qualitative and quantitative data for modeling risk assessment and planning decisions. Um, and training opportunities on um, particularly at the local scale on utilizing and applying that new data and using that to be able to identify the additional gaps that exist once we get down to supporting local scale implementation um, and uh, understanding what really is useful and successful and how localities are using this data. Um, so co-production really to have that customer feedback and iteration between the two. For innovation, we talked about um, expanding accelerator programs for emerging resilience and adaptation innovations, kind of like Troy already described, um, statewide strategies for continuing to support this co-production and attempts to create these, envir these innovation environments that help move from just information sharing to creating knowledge as we go forward. We did identify a couple of other questions that we wanted to, to jump in and Rebecca jump in at any time I'm a loud mouth, everybody knows it. Um, the role, what is the role of local, regional and state agencies in supporting local and regional resilience champions? Uh, this was something that came out of a session that was actually done by someone who, a uh, professor at Virginia Tech named Mark Stern who is an expert in evaluation and has been doing evaluation of resilience processes at the local level nationwide over the last five years. And having a resilience champion is extremely key to where things have been done based on workshops and engagements in the past and where they haven't. So what's the role of developing and supporting those people? Um, defining what resilience success looks like and identifying these mechanisms to continue to support collaboration among the diverse public and private sector stakeholders we have at the table. Rebecca, did I miss anything? No, I think you covered everything well. I Again, I, I think a big focus for our group is really how are we going about, you know, creating those environments where we're able to take these products and this data um, from phase two and actually be able to progress it forward and continue collaboration. Um, so yeah, everything else covered well. Great. Well, thank you. So for a moment, we'll turn it back over to Matt and look towards a public comment period. All right. Thank you, Linda. If there are any uh, members of the public who are on the meeting who wish to speak and provide public comment, uh, please uh, type your name into the chat uh, so that we can recognize you and, and allow you to come off mute and provide comment. As of now, no one has indicated they want to chat or want to speak. Okay. Um, so there's it's eleven forty one right now. Um, we can either 
if there's anything that needs to be continued regarding recommendations, we can continue with those. Uh, the other option is also to open up uh, to any new business items that a member uh, would seek to discuss. Um, so I'll kind of defer to our chair. I think Alex has left, uh, but we still have Dave and, and Linda. I don't know how we feel with the uh, recommendations and to the rest of the subcommittee members, if you all have any additional comments on recommendations or if you have any other items that you would wish to discuss beyond um, recommendations, now is the opportunity to do so. Hey, this is Dave. Does Does anybody else have other thoughts to add on? And Dave, if it's okay, if no one has other thoughts, I have a, a thought to kind of close us out today around sure. recommendations. And that is, so for your sub subcommittee members, what I'd love to do is just go around and just tell us one, one sentence or one thought that came to you after this process of the meeting today. Like what stood out for you? For example, it could be, this was fun to collaborate, or it could be, I really want X, Y, and Z to happen. So this is for you just to mention something personally that would relate back into this group, kind of a feeling from the day or something that you feel strongly about. And I'd like to do it by popcorning it, but I'd like each one of you to have a chance definitely to say something. And if you don't wanna say something, um, you can just say one word, which could be like weekend. Anything at all? Who wants to go first? Just unmute yourself. I can go first. That way, nobody. When everyone else, you know, we, we go down the list, and 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 nobody has anything left on your list because I said it already. Um, I was actually so uh, really pleasantly surprised to see. I thought there was a lot of consistency across the breakout groups. That there were some some themes there that were clearly coming together, and and that um, was was good to see. It makes your job easier. Thanks, Troy. I can go next. Um, my word would be co-production. So this is something that um, I know a lot of universities are working on. And I was heartened to see Jess mention that as well. And I think in terms of our aspirations moving forward, phase three, figuring out effective ways to engage with community members to make sure our work is most relevant to finding solutions for their needs is super important this weekend. Great. <laughs> Thanks, Karen. Popcorning off of what Karen said. Um, I think it's, it's really easy to think about the what's, but I want to encourage us to continue to think about the how's thinking about the continuing structure and networking and collaboration is definitely not the sexy part, but it's the key to whether or not we're successful in the long run. Thank you. I'll jump in, this is Dave. Um, I, I appreciated the conversation in our breakout room uh, regarding different types of public engagement, uh, not just the old tried and true public hearing, public information format. Great. Thanks. I'll, I'll jump in and I, it's more of a question than it is a comment, but I, I, I thought some of the ideas brought forward by the the other two groups were, were very good. And I wonder if, are we going to have a chance to, to as a single entity, are we going to have a chance to discuss those further or what are the next steps um, regarding, you know, the final disposition of the, of those particular recommendations? Great. And Mike, I'll answer that as soon as everyone talks, I'll explain that. That's a great question. Thanks. I can go ahead. Um, 
something that we talked about within our group as well was cross pollination with the other subcommittees. So that has something uh, that has been on my mind and, and how we'll be able to mesh these different priorities together. Great. We've got Ian and Ben. I can go. I think peer share is just a tried and true technique and it's good to see it applied outside of educational context. And it's nice to see that groups are separated, but we had a lot of connecting themes when we went back into the group and I appreciate Arthur and Mike and Ben, their contributions in the group helped me formulate my, my thoughts and remember things that happened that may be useful for Virginia today. Great. Thanks. I think, Dan, it might just be you we haven't heard from yet. Looking forward to having conversations in person instead of virtually. Great. Okay, well, thank you. Did I miss anyone? Who's a subcommittee member? I have seven of you. I think that's that's right. Four, five. Okay. Thank you so much for the wonderful participation. And to answer Mike's question, these different recommendations, they'll be captured first in raw form in what the meeting minutes will be, you know, the summaries. And then from there, we'll be taking them and putting them out to you in a survey questionnaire where you're going to see all of them for your subcommittee. And then um, from that, you can, basically you're voting on prioritization between now and the next meeting in the third quarter. And you're also having a chance when you're voting to add more. So if you think of things sometime between now and, and that time of sending out the survey, go ahead and add others. When we get back together in person for Q3's meeting, you will be able to see all these different uh, recommendations. You'll see what the prioritizations turned out to be. And we'll then start in another discussion to start honing these re recommendations to ideally get to three to five of them. And by the fourth meeting, you'll be voting on those three and three to five to go to be recommended uh, to come up to the TAC. Wonderful. I'll turn it back over to Matt. Matt, did you have any thoughts you wanted to add? No, thank you everybody for your time. I mean, we can't do this all without you all participating. Um, so thanks for taking the time out of your schedule before the holiday weekend uh, to jump on the call. Our next meeting, it will be an in-person meeting. There is always the hybrid option, um, especially if you have uh, lived more than 60 miles away, but if possible, uh, please try to make the trip in more than likely to Richmond uh, for the meeting. We're working on getting that date and location finalized um, and out to you all as soon as possible. Right now, it's looking end of July, early August timeframe. Um, and in that meeting, we'll have a quick update on where we're at with the flood hazard assessment. Um, but then, yeah, the bulk of the meeting will be in-person discussion for these recommendations uh, and we'll be, as Linda mentioned, collecting some additional feedback in between um, this meeting and our next meeting. So please be on the lookout um, and we'll try to keep it as short and brief as possible, but still uh, try to get some information to better prepare us for those. We just have two hours in the next meeting and then another we have four hours left together. Um, so trying to get the most out of it. So thanks again, everybody for for your time and your input. I think that's all that I have. Uh, unless any other members have any other items, I'll turn it back over to Dave uh, to see uh, if there's anything else or if we're ready to adjourn. All right, does anybody have any closing thoughts or new business? All right. Do we have a motion to adjourn? Motion to adjourn. All right. 
Any object? Any seconds? No. I'll second. All right. Any any objections? Or we can adjourn by acclamation. Sounds great. We are adjourned. Everyone have a great weekend. Have a good weekend. Thanks. Yeah.